Today we're celebrating an anniversary because 10 years ago, Panasonic joined Olympus to announce the arrival of the Micro Four Third system. And today we're gonna talk about why they did that and the impact it had on the camera world. Let's get undone. What is happening everybody? I'm Gerald Undyne and in August of 2008, a new lens mount was announced by Olympus and Panasonic for a new mirrorless format camera system, the Micro Four Thirds. As a lover of this system, I thought it'd be fun to take today's video to discuss some of the more interesting history behind this release, as well as provide sort of a basic buyer's guide to my viewers who are just getting into cameras. First of all, I just wanna give a quick shout out to Camera Canada who frequently provide me with the gear that I use to make these videos. I highly recommend them, so to any of my fellow Canadians who are looking to get some camera gear, make sure you check out their links in the description below. All right, so what even is a Micro Four Thirds? What does that phrase mean? And why did anyone even think that we needed it? Well, let's get the micro part out of the way first because it's the easiest. In this case, micro pretty much means mirrorless because the four-thirds system already existed in the DSLR variety. And so it's micro because part of going mirrorless means that you don't need the space for the pentaprism or the mirror box. So the flange distance and the body get considerably smaller. Now this is true for any mirrorless system, but this one specifically was based on Olympus's four-thirds system from a few years prior. Only this time, instead of Kodak helping with development, Panasonic stepped in to help with the mirrorless development of the four-thirds system. And the first camera that they ever released was actually the Panasonic Sonic Lumix DMC G1 known just as the G1. Flash forward to today and we've got all the way up to the G9 now. So now what about the four thirds part? Many people will tell you that this name comes from the aspect ratio of the sensor, which is 18 millimeters by 13.5 millimeters typically, or a four to three ratio. And although this makes sense, it's not actually true. The name actually refers to the physical size of the sensor, which is almost exactly half the size of a 35 millimeter full frame sensor. It gets its name from an old technology called video camera tubes, which were used to capture television images and were prominent from like the 30s until the 1980s until CCDs took over. These tubes were essentially cathode ray tubes, which were akin to the vacuum tubes found in old televisions, which is why TV got its nickname, the tube. Anyway, when you measure these tubes, you have to use a formula because the size of the tubes includes the glass enclosure that goes over them, but that doesn't represent the actual usable area on the inside, which is about two thirds of the size of the entire tube. And this is where the four thirds sensor starts to get its name. So the first thing you need to do in this formula formula is you need to know the diagonal of the sensor. So we know that the four thirds sensor is 18 millimeters by 13.5 millimeters. In order to figure out the diagonal, we're gonna have to use the Pythagorean theorem, which is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So if we take the square of 18 millimeters, which is 324, and then take the square of 13.5 millimeters, which is 182.25, that's a total of 506.25. And then we get the square root of that, c squared, which is 22.5 millimeters. So the diagonal of a four third sensor is 22.5 millimeters. Now if we put that into the video camera tube formula, which is diagonal times three over two, or 22.5 millimeters times three over two times 1.5, we get 33.75 millimeters. That would be the size of the glass tube for which the micro four thirds sensor could be inside on a diagonal, if that makes sense, including the glass enclosure. But those glass tubes were usually measured in inches, so we have to convert the 33.75 millimeters into inches, which at a rate of 25.4 millimeters to one inch, gives us 1.33 inches, or one and one third inches, which can also be represented as four thirds inches, hence the four third inch image sensor, or the four thirds. I know you math fans out there are like, oh cool, that's such an interesting way to come up with a name for something. And everybody else is thinking, why in the hell would they come up with such a bizarre, convoluted, esoteric way to name a system that, that using a technology that wasn't even around when the camera system was being invented? And I can kind of see both sides of that there, but I did think it was interesting. And I also think it's better to dispel those rumors because everybody's going around saying, oh, it's the ratio of four to three. It's not the ratio. Although coincidentally, it is kind of cool that the ratio is also four to three when most typical cameras have a three to two aspect ratio. And a lot of these modern ones, you actually can switch it between three to two and 16 by nine and that kind of thing. But the typical, you know, original format is a four by three ratio. So I can understand where that misunderstanding came from. So now that we know all that, why would anybody even want a four thirds image sensor? Well, for two reasons mainly. One, 
It's smaller. This allows you to have wider, faster lenses be much more compact. Typically, a comparable lens for a full-frame camera would be much larger, much heavier, and much more expensive, and in many cases, not that much better, if at all. The second advantage is how the path of light meets the sensor. Because of something called telecentric optical path, the light is meeting the sensor in a much more perpendicular way, allowing for brighter corners and better off-center resolution than you'd find on larger sensor formats, especially when shooting at wide-angle focal lengths. There's also some disadvantages that go along with having a smaller sensor as well. And for this, you need to know two things. One, that a pixel can only be so small based on our current technological capabilities. And two, the more pixels you have, the resolution goes up, but the surface area of each individual pixel goes down. So this tells us two more things, that a larger sensor will always have more pixels than a micro four thirds sensor when they're using the same size pixels because there's just more space to put more pixels on the larger sensor. And two, if the sensors have the same amount of pixels between a micro four thirds and a larger sensor, the pixels on the larger sensor will be bigger and thus will have a larger surface area for a sensitive area for light. Also, there's a depth of field difference between micro four thirds sensors and say full frame sensors, for instance, because of something called a crop factor. Now, because the micro four thirds sensor is half the size of a full frame sensor, a 35 millimeter sensor, any image that you look at that has the same focal length will have a sort of twice as zoomed, a two times crop look on the micro four thirds. So let's say for instance that you were taking an image with a 35 millimeter lens on the micro four thirds, that will have the same field of view as a 70 millimeter lens on a full frame camera. And because depth of field is determined outside of aperture by your distance from the subject and the focal length of the lens that you're using, it's pretty much impossible to achieve the same depth of field with a micro four thirds camera as you can with a full frame camera, assuming that the apertures are constant. For example, let's say that you were taking a portrait of somebody that was five meters away and you were using a 100 millimeter lens at f2.8 on a full frame camera. And you took the photo and you're like, I really like that depth of field. I like the amount of bokeh that I'm getting. If you try to take that same image with a micro four thirds camera and you took a 100 millimeter lens and you stood in the same spot and it was an f2.8, you'd be getting an equivalent focal length of 200 millimeters. So your field of view would be much more narrow. It wouldn't be the same shot anymore even though the depth of field might appear to be the same, but your shot is no longer the same. So you'd have to back up twice as far in order to get the same shot because you're shooting at a 200 millimeter equivalent. And then when you took the shot, although the field of view would be the same, the depth of field wouldn't be the same. It would be less shallow because you're further away and so you'd have less bokeh. So then if you thought, well, I'll use a 50 millimeter lens then because that's a 100 millimeter equivalent and I'll stand in the same place and I'll take the same image, then yes, again, you'll achieve the same field of view, but you'll still have a less shallow depth of field and still have less bokeh because you're using a 50 millimeter lens instead of a 100 millimeter lens and so therefore the depth of field increases. So no matter how you slice it, if the aperture is the same, a micro four thirds system will always have twice as deep depth of field and half as much bokeh. So when you lay it all out like that, it kind of seems like it'd be silly to get a four thirds system due to the disadvantages in low light resolution and depth of field. But this is where Panasonic stepped in when they launched the micro system with Olympus to show how you can take those disadvantages and turn them into unmatched advantages. In terms of size, micro four thirds should and could be somewhere between the compact point and shoot cameras and the smaller DSLRs. But when you look at a lot of the higher end models from Panasonic, they're actually not that much smaller than DSLRs. And that's because Panasonic figured out what to do with that extra space, which was to turn these cameras into an incredible hybrid photo video workhorse. The micro four thirds sensor is easier to keep cool than conventional sensors. So you can use higher resolution video with better codecs for longer record times and still manage to keep it under control. Take the GH5 for instance, you can record 4K at 60 frames per second, pretty much indefinitely. And you can also record 4K at 10 bit internally with a large range of codec size flexibility. These cameras come with full size, clean HDMI out ports, USB, mic in, headphone out, and large batteries that last surprisingly long for their cost. They usually offer the fastest photo drive modes of anything in the business, usually hitting 20 frames a second and beyond. They offer complex shooting modes and in-camera transitions and functions that are usually only found on higher end cinema cameras. And due to their short flange distance, they can be adapted to host a huge variety of lenses from different mounts. But they also have a surprise surprisingly vast and impressive collection of native lenses from Panasonic and Olympus that are so compact that you can fit an entire array of primes into a small camera bag without ever causing fatigue, making it probably the best travel camera system in the market. Micro Four Thirds is a pretty interesting system that has offered photographers and videographers options that can't really be found anywhere else in its size and price range. And over the last 10 years, it's made pretty big leaps forward culminating in its current lineup. 
Now, I've read some critics online that think that the Micro Four Thirds system has reached its peak and should rightfully die off. Now that Sony has figured out a way to balance full frame features and value together, like with the A7 III, and now with Fuji doing most of what Panasonic and Olympus is doing in their bodies, but with a larger sensor and with better quality. And the truth is, I really don't know what the future holds for the Micro Four Thirds system. I do know that at the moment, there really isn't another camera on the market that can do everything the GH5 or even the G9 can do. And I also know that every time I think they've reached their end for innovation, they announce some new lens or an update that renews their relevance and makes me want to buy that new thing so badly. In either case, at the very least, we need to recognize the impressive feats that Olympus and Panasonic have pulled off over the last 10 years with this system, because as somebody who shoots a great deal of his videos on Micro Four Thirds, I know my channel wouldn't be the same without them. And so that brings me to my question for you guys. What kind of impact has the Micro Four Thirds system had on your life? Do you have one? Have you used one? Did you like it? Do you not like it? Let me know in the comments below. Anyway, that's gonna be it for me. I hope you found this video helpful or at least entertaining. And if you did, make sure you leave it the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, feel free to hit the dislike button twice. All right, I'm done.